We're going to um, start introducing the speakers first. Um, we'll have uh, Jose Eduardo Paravelli, who is a member of the USINA Centro de Trabalho para o Ambiente Habitado, uh, USINA's Center of Work for the um, habit Inhabited Environment, um, lasting uh, institution working with housing and communities and, and social movements. After that, we'll have Alejandro Echeverri, um, Again, I think it's, it's better um, to look for the full bio because it's very hard to summarize the, what I think is, uh, these speakers have as a comprehensive um, field of work. Alejandro Echeverri uh, from the Center of Urban and Environmental Studies of Eafit University. Um, after that, we'll have Alejandro Hayek Kohl, who is the co-founder and director of Lab Profab and currently uh, associate professor at Umeå University in Sweden. And, Last but not least, and whenever she uh, comes, we'll have Janice Perlman, uh, a senior research scholar at the Institute for Latin American Studies at Columbia University and president of the Mega Cities Project. Uh, Jose, whenever you want. Thank you. Thanks, Alejandro. Thanks, everyone, for this great opportunity to be here. I'm a, a Brazilian architect and also a professor at the University of Sao Paulo but I was invited um, to the symposium as a practitioner and a member since 2007 of Uzina. As you can hear that, we spell U, Uzina. Uzina is an NGO founded in 1919 by architects to support housing movements that were emerging back then at the end of military rule in Brazil. In 28 years of activity and activism, we always worked for housing and social movements, always. Like this, some victories, many defeats, I have to admit. Since slums are such a complex phenomenon as we have been discussing here, Usina Profile offers to slum dwellers some solutions but also a problem. The solutions come from our design and building process that I will call for now participatory. The problem is we are architects. <laughs> Whatever be our proposals, they are formal spaces to be built with formal funds. How can we design formal space for such informal cities like Brazilian favelas? In order to answer this, I will break the question in three. Where to build, how to build, and uh, what to build inside the slum. The first question demands a precision about slums, while the second one, how to build, is far more important than what to build. But first, where to build? This place, place like that. Slums as commodified spaces have this important in continuity with formal cities. They segregate its poorest inhabitants to its worst locations. Places like this. In Brazil, those locations are narrow watercourses in large sloped areas, the least qualified locations for large conventional housing projects. Therefore, every large slum has another slum inside it, where poverty is dominant. Many speakers yesterday made clear that there are disconnections between poverty and slums. Agreed, but this is the case only in older and consolidated portions of a slum. So, how we address this problem? In Brazil, those locations are open. Sorry. So, how we address this question? How to build anything in those places? For us, this is a political question as much as a technical question since we try to convert both the design and the building process into an empowerment process. The self-help housing cooperatives in Uruguay, mentioned by Lorena Zaret yesterday, is our model here 
and a more recent photo. So how, so during the design process, it is inevitable to deal here with commonplace discussions of a participatory process, say how large will be the kitchen, blah, blah. And in spite of that, we put those subjects always in a political context concerning social expectations and rights. We treat them as generative themes, the pedagogical concept proposed by Paulo Freire. For instance, design is discussed in separated group instead of general meetings like this. In this way, women can talk free from male surveillance about their views on house and child raising. In that moment, kitchens with a table to kids, uh, where kids can do homework usually gets larger and uh, Space for sofa and TV gets smaller. <laughs> <laughs> so the building process. During the building process, we struggle to simplify the most expensive parts of the building and then train its future inhabitants to construct those parts. In this photo, we can see how simple is this lab's composition. The steel structure provides the builders with a permanent special reference and safe circulation for people and loads. Another people. Oh, so the regular dimensions of the structural bricks can be multiplied multiply to the whole project. This has 20 years now. More important, this. It's a training process. The building process acts as an empowerment process, especially for women. Their performance in all building operations reverts every social prejudice, especially in a macho culture in Brazil. So self-help process is not just a budget strategy. It's a way to convert mere users of a formal space into their mentors and producers a known virtue of any formal building process. So what to design in informal cities? My last question. If we want a participatory process, it has to be some housing, but aiming to expand urban infrastructure to low density and hazardous portions of slum. Four lessons learned uh, through our 28 years of experience. One, a free layout is mandatory in housing for slums, especially at public access level. Two, any open space must be clearly either a private space or a public space, no gray zones. Every tree, every maintenance cost must be one family cost. A recent proposal for slums Try to bring together these qualities in a four-story building with independent access to two households and adapted for sloped areas. Oops. But that's my next question. Because the building itself is, has less interest than the fact that it has designed to be encircled by the slum incorporated into it as a piece of formal space that has a clear urban purpose. Just to illustrate this point, I want to address an architecture model widely known here in New England. This and this become this. Elemental proposal of a mix of formal and informal building, as you can see in a project in Monterrey, Mexico, well, this model was always considered inacceptable by slum dwellers in Sao Paulo. No one cares about the visual quality, they are evident, of the formal building, but they do disgust the controlled and enclosed space assigned for an informal expansion. Instead of this, that little buildings are in those yellow spaces. 
This plan shows a different story. While Elemental places architecture as a prime solution for slums and informal construction as something to be tolerated within it, our work in a long and together with housing social movements led us to an opposite approach, <coughs> which places informal design in the informal construction as a prime solution for slums and considers architecture as formal design as something to be tolerated inside it, as long as it brings optimal solutions to expand infrastructure and safe housing uh, without removals, like we tried here. And here, eventually, the new formal design, incorporated and enclosed by the informal city, will make possible for this informality to expand even more but in a safer way. So, engulfed by the informality, the formal space, I hope, will succeed. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I think now it's Alejandro. Uh, thank you very much, you say Now uh, we'll have Alejandro Echeverri uh, from the Center of Urban Environmental Studies at the AFIT University. And I have to say that knowing these practices for so long, I see and I suffer the, the, the issue of synthesis. There is so much to discuss and present that I, I appreciate the effort. Where I can put this. Oh, you're going to use that? No, 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 no. It's only oh. to read. Um, you could put this in there. So do you have um, this uh, yes. light? Yeah, that's right here. Thank you. <clears throat> so thanks uh, for the invitation. Uh, I am, it's an honor to be here in this uh, amazing three days of uh, ideas and, and dialogues. Mm, I, would, I would like to share some ideas and lessons that uh, I personally have and, and as well we in, in our group have uh, since uh, have been working close to 20 years in Medellin in some specific areas and barrios in Medellin. So we started in 1997 with research and proposals and then I went to the government between 2004 and 2012. First with Sergio Fajardo, he was the director of urban projects and the Institute of Urban Development that we developed a social urbanism strategy. And in 2012, we co-found uh, URBAM. It's an initiative, an, an institute of research, and as well, and uh, like uh, we mediate with different, with different alternatives. So I don't like to use the word uh, slums. Uh, I, I, not me, we can't. In, it's not a question for us in Medellin. Uh, we talk about barrios, neighborhoods, and uh, because from the beginning it's important to build a complicity and, and as well a, a relation that uh, break some boundaries. So for us it's, it's, it's not a question, and we use, and I am going to use barrios like uh, neighborhoods, because as well the reality is not uh, black and white. You, you have been seeing here the difference, and there is an amazing uh, spectrum of colors with problems and opportunities and, and a lot of layers, so it's important to, to understand that. So I, I, I'm going to, for, for concept, the idea of time. So we, the time, the question of time is really important because we are working with an organic process and that uh, happens in different phases and each phase needs different solutions too. So it's important to understand that. Between those two images are 40 years and is the same place. So you, you see this is the Moravia Barrio and uh, used to be the, the dump and garbage disposal of the city. And today is a barrio of more than 40,000 inhabitants. And, but it's a reality. 
So it's not a, it's a permanent, permanent condition. And, and it's important because it's important to know that the improvement is going on. They still have a lot of problems, but it's becoming very attractive. I predict that maybe in 15 years, many of us will, be, will want to live there. And I am seriously, I am not joking with that. So it's in, 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 in a part of connection. The location is the frontier between the downtown and the barrios of the north. So the second, the second concept that I would like to share with you is the concept of typologies, is the concept of diversity, is the, is the question of faces. Those two images, we took those two images in the same day, but looks like they has a distance of 40 years. So it's the same, is the, is the condition, but are completely different. So we were, have been working here during our years in the government, doing different, many different things. And this territory and those barrios used to be, all of them, 100% informal before. And it used to be the periphery of the city, but today are in, in the central part. So, public transportations, education and culture, links, housing, etc., etc. I'm not going to explain in detail. So, we are working since 2012 in this completely different problem that is happening in the upper part of the city, where active occupation is still happening. So, we we need a completely different agenda. We need, um, we call this process shifting ground or rehabilitar la ladera, a develop a more sustainable process worth it, working with community and environment. But mostly, mostly trying to anticipate, mitigate risk and build processes. Giving a better conditions for the future and trying to prevent risk, risk areas. So it's a more modest, but a different, a different process that could happen from that, that perspective. So the second idea is, is, is uh, important for us, and I think we have been talking about this question. <coughs> the positive things, talking about opportunities. Stigmatizing is very easy and is the first wall that you build in these processes. So is, 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 if, if a public agenda belongs to the violence, belongs to give visibility to the violence and the problems, you are not going to solve the problem. Because you need, you need friendship, you need complicity, you need good people to work with. So this is very important. So the, the image to the left was a sketch of uh, Fajardo, Sergio Fajardo, the mayor itself, and he used to explain in a very simple way. So the challenge is how we could open and increase the size of the door of opportunities. And talk about opportunities in the, in the, in the local level and in the, in the, in the, from the top down and from the bottom up too. And this was a map that we did at that time. We used to work with the communities and the different uh, uh, programs from the government, trying to articulate inside the government and we, as well with local initiatives, some good, good uh, processes that happens and good people trying to connect them and empower, give more possibilities to them. So that is one thing that I would like to, to share with you. Those two images belong to other part of the city the Comuna 13. Maybe some of you have uh, heard about Comuna 13, one of the most violent places in Medellin in the history, and we still have big problems there in different conditions. So the Comuna 13 is here. You see this yellow line marks the frontier. But today the reality is not, o sea, the, our approach, and I, I think the, 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 the challenge is how could you inf infiltrate how could you, could you increase the porosity of processes and flows? And how could you, in some way, build a more uh, cohesive environment of processes? So sometimes you have 
big difference between one and, and the other. Sometimes helps a lot to have the proximity, so not very big gap. So how to reduce the gap maybe could happen with a buffer zones or new programs, cable car, the metro station, the new cable that connect the community. This is a library park. So this is a um, process that could, uh, in, in, in some way, could help a lot. <clears throat> with the same idea, these points of connection could happen physically or programmatically or trying to connect people most only. So this is a very simple strategy to break the frontier between two barriers that used to belong to different militias. This is the picture, the cable car here, and how can you improve the itinerary of the people, everyday life that go to the transport and public transport from the houses and so on. But it has the same importance where new programs activate and link those frontiers. <clears throat> so, but this, I was explain, explaining to you a good history, but I have very bad news <laughs> because we still have working with people and communities in the last months we go inside the Comuna 13 again. We have been always in touch, but we are very deep processes. And uh, we realized that many, most of the kids has the same history. Most of the kids of the Comuna 13, for them is a challenge to survive. So maybe they move easily, but the history is not very different. And we are talking about 20 years after. So, I am, and I am saying after, after, after very, very strong investment of the, of the government, after very uh, good strategies, but as well, most of them doesn't link with the local narratives itself. So, we co-found Urbam in 2010, trying to, to develop a parallel agenda, not from the government now, because the government changed, and trying to be, develop a mediator that could link as well infrastructure, environment, people, but mostly uh, local histories and with governments as, as well. To be more strategic, maybe more, more modest, and uh, with, uh, working a lot with the local capacity. So this, this guy, Fernando Zapata, is a part of this history. This is an amazing person. We met him when we were working in the upper part of the hills. He was against our strategies at that time, and he is now our, our most uh, powerful partner. So in, we invite him four years ago to be in our team. We invite him, we have a master program, processes, that we work with emerging processes and so on, and he studied for two years with us. And he, uh, um, he is an amazing person. He, he did a, a thesis that we are working with as well, this picture belongs to yesterday. Fernando is with the mayor, with the director of the metropolitan area, with different organizations, talking about they, their initiatives uh, in, in, in relation to solve the upper part of the mountains. So, and they won, they won one month, one month, one month uh, ago, they won the municipal prize, prize for social initiatives with his organization. So those people belong to the upper part of the mountains and has a completely different dialogue. There is not a solution yet, but we hope with them, with us, we could push for a new agenda and parallel agenda. And this is, 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 is very important in relation with, uh, with the, the history. So I, I must say that I am really, really happy and me emociono mucho, I don't know how to say in, in, <laughs> in English, in relation with when I, I see these initiatives uh, going, going around. So this is the last image, but this is not enough. So they are today, they have more knowledge, a bigger voice, but it's not enough. 
So how to solve that thing? I don't, we don't know, but we are starting a new initiative. This initiative is like a platform of agreements. How we could mediate, how we could work with these local leaders, but as well, we have a very good relation with um, civic leaders, not politicians only. Because the question is how to avoid the fragility of politics and the discontinuity of politics. And we, we, we realize and that in Medellin we have a completely exceptional condition. Even with this exceptional condition, the process is cut. So the, the government doesn't continue, didn't continue the ur urban integral projects of the strategy of social urbanism that, that you saw. The government stopped the participatory budget and continue some things that are important. But the, the, many of the things that link with people change in some way. So this question, and now we are working, we have been working with many different people. This is an amazing guy. I received from him this week three or four calls. The name is Aka. His life was very hard in the Comuna 13. He was, he, he, his family was, uh, were displaced from the Comuna. And he has a program that the name is Agroarte, like uh, Grow with Art. Is he is doing a process with the moms and the kids and the young people, trying to recover the memory of the place, planting and giving each plant a name. And it's a beautiful process. So he is going to be in our master program the next January too, and Boti that is, going to, is working with him as well. So we are together working in this idea of the platform of agreements, how we could develop this agreement for the Comuna 13 first, and then if we success, how could we replicate? And has to be a more strategic, maybe more modest platform of actions and processes with, inf with, with infrastructure as well, but more precise ones, but more connected with the local histories. So, and permanent as well, because the the, t the continuity is the most, the con how to continue the dialogue is the most important thing. It's the only way to build trust in those things, in those pr in challenges. Our goal is to change the life of the barrios. And our, our ideal is how we could improve structurally that condition. And, and as well, and uh, how could we help to a powerful and nar narrative and a common agenda. And, it, and our goal, goal is to, if we are going to talk with this kid of 16, maybe not in four, six years, the, the history has to be different. So this is, um, the, those are the ideas that they wanted to share with you, but as well, we need support and partners for this platform. So we are inviting you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro, for a um, wonderful presentation. Now we have another Alejandro, and I'm myself Alejandro, so this is the Alejandro <laughs> session. Um, now we're going to have uh, Alejandro Hayek, co founder and director of. La Profab uh, in Venezuela, and currently associate professor at uh, Umeo University. Four years ago, I met Alejandro Castro in New York, uh, trying to figure out how to keep going with our practice in Caracas. And I was trying to explain that 20 years ago, we became rebellious. We tried to understand our practice as a subver sub subversive practice, the possibility of architecture to really recreate our, the, uh, of ev our everyday life. And I was very angry at that point, watching how the government copy our procedures, our methodologies, and 
and transform them in a is a, as a political act. And Alejandro was saying to me, like, with, I, I know that our uh, uh, buildings are very uh, modest uh, in, so, in such, a, such a way. Uh, he was telling me in a very tough way that just keep going because what I describe is very much what happened in the history of the city. You know? uh, architecture is a political act. Mm -hmm. And he said me something that was fantastic. He said me try to show the histories that are behind the project that are actually more important than the project itself. Mm -hmm. so, in, so in that way, I realized that the, um, the buildings is just an excuse. It's just a surface, a platform to uh, support different cultural activities. So this is the history of uh, Gladys and Luz Marina. They live uh, in uh, uh, Los Sin Techo, which is a kind of without roof. It's a favela or, uh, in Barquisimeto, the third industrial city in Venezuela. As Pancho Lierno was explaining to us yesterday, was, we cannot generalize the term because it's a very different types of, uh, of uh, slums or favelas. If you see this beside of a highway, in the, also beside of an industrial area, but it's the material, the physicality that we can find there is completely different. We can still see like a very countryside protocols or practices. People manage to find, uh, uh, to, to control the energy or to, or to manage the energy and the, also the resources. And this is the house that they have. It's a very beautiful house when we, uh, we together with other uh, groups, we try to find and to access to a uh, national participatory funding. And Luz Marina have a disability uh, uh, problem. Uh, they live in this house. It's a very small house. They used to live in that house that actually is three meters below the streets. And Luz Marina never reached the streets, never, reached, never be in contact with the people. As you see, they pr building progressively. And we really realized that why we like to intervene. So we ver first, we try to understand the inventory of the memory, the memories behind there, the ways that they uh, manage the water uh, collect collections, the objects that they have, all the objects that contain all the memory of this house, all the di plastic dishes, the furniture, uh, um, and try to understand that our, our operations should recreate and understand what happened there, the atmospheres, the nature that is behind of this uh, house. The, beside beside the, the mango trees, beside the avocado trees, where they used to spend the whole day. So the operations that we try to do when we get the fund, uh, and of course the inflation in Venezuela reached this amazing point, that the money that we received was very low to do that. So we asking for materials, we asking for profiles and uh, isolated isolation boards uh, for the roof. And of course, they rejected the project. And we were so connected with this family that we cannot go in out. And that's a very nice, uh, interesting reflection how architects produce projects and then someone build it for them. We, and uh, how we can recreate these protocols to really understand what we can just spend our whole life making a few projects, but deeply is perhaps it's more interesting to make uh, several projects. You know? So we were there, trying to find the way to spend an, a year in the favela, trying to find the way how to do that, you know? how to understand, to insert a, a structure that allow Luz Marina to reach the streets. When we do that, as you see, the ramp occupy the 30% of the budget, so which is, there's no policies about disabilities in, in social housing. So we say we cannot make a Sabula Raza. There's impossible to erase the moment, to delete the, moment, the memories, and very much the resources that are there is very much what we have, need to use to really recreate the environment there. So we insert a, a structure with the profiles that we receive and, uh, and try to make a kind of metamorphosis, metamorphosis between the previous house and the new house. So the, but, but actually it's the same house. It was the same material, the same memory that we connect with a new structure. So Maestro Cesar, the local master started to put out every table, every screw. Luz Marina always participated in this uh, uh, for the process. They, they cannot go going out from the house to waiting for receive a new house. And at the beginning, she was very exciting. But of course, then we, she was very, very exhausted about the process of construction. So. And then we, every table, every screw was so important for us. We categorized, we classified all everything, every part that we're assembling. And then 
Maestros is about figure, figuring out, because the, promise pro, the pro, uh, government promised them that the, they're going to give some machines and they're going to support them with that. Then we was struggling there how to build. But you say, well, there's it's very much the, everybody that have been in a construction know that we, they can create a welding machine with just a, a can of water. No? You just put a piece of wood and you put some wires there and the number of rounds that you make is depend of the, the quality of the welding. No? We, of course, asking for our engineer to review that and he actually certified that it was a very nice welding. No? So the expertise was there, the intelligence was, was were in the favela. No? So the favelas also contain all the energies and all the expertises in local intelligence to really recreate their own activities. Gladys also have some uh, 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 incredible ski, uh, skills. She know how to weave in. She like to collect uh, furniture in the street and then uh, build it. And she actually weave their own, their own house. No? And it was a, such a beautiful uh, process because then when we saw there, we had such a humble and modest, uh, humble uh, house, we realized that it, we are creating a, a domestic, domestic landscape. Like a, the, we are more focused more than on space and object and shapes we are really creating new atmospheres. No? So the object, the plastic, uh, the issues is was related with the same color with the, from the skin. Everything was fixed together. The house was there, imprinted in the same facade. No? All the woods were, were there. So and Gladys tried to now to recreate how she can figure out how to use the house to support, because also she liked to cultivate. No? Luz Marina, now, the, as you see, the, the face is completely different. He reached the streets. He always are in the, in the door. The house, he just have a door in the front. We extrude the same position of the previous door and put it in the front. And now uh, she also take this adventure to walking outside of the house and, and just try to uh, relate it with a lot of kids. You know? We cannot control what happened now. So it's a kind of a confrontation, a friction between public and private because the house also it's, a, it's just a terrace, so the kids play in the roof. This is a kind of extension. <laughs> so the, for our favela that wasn't named no, the non-roof uh, favelas, now there is a roof that is public. No? But th there is another, another uh, history about Sair Navas, which is a community leader in a very strong favela, one of the most popular favela in Caracas, perhaps the ten, top 10 in the world, in Katia. He have, like, he have like almost 40 years old, and 30 years ago the government built this huge, massive plant, uh, housing plant. They really expect that the people is gonna move from the favela to those buildings. No? But what happened with some friends of Said that they moved to the buildings and immediately transformed in a middle class, and they, Said was not allowed to play in the same basketball jar of the building. So immediately architecture create a problem more than solve it. So we, look, we used to create problems in places that there is no problems. And, the buildings and architecture actually is a, can create frontiers or div divisions or, or boundaries or borders or uh, instead to create boundaries on threshold. So this is the, there was a terrain in, in beside of the stairs, which is the principal um, um, channel of communication in the favela, that the community say for th uh, 30 years, they won a, a battle in the cartel. Have you seen this, this amazing a grid or a fa fabric that reveal how strong could be architecture. And the community say for this space, and Senora Soraya was showing me a picture from the box of memories that she had. And then I realized that was Sair there, tried to make making the first floor for a basketball field in the same terrain. And I realized, well, I just joined to a problem that exists there before me. So it's, it's so interesting to join to problems that are already there Cities are surrounding, and special slums are surrounding that, that province. This is so interesting how we can just uh, connect with a problem that really exists there before. So as you see, the stairs was completely destroyed. So the project, is, uh, of course, we organize the community in, a, in groups that can access to some budget. And we ask in, we make a protest in the front of the municipality, and the municipality allow, uh, try to insert a, a construction company the community, of course, fight against that and try to put the 80% of the people in the construction. And then we recreate a sort of, sort of a re-engineer of the territory first to canalize the water. We organize the, the, the stairs. And we noticed that there could be a building without no one uh, door, a building that in every step of the favela you can access with uh, several multipurpose programs. So 
the building is a kind of hybrid. It's a, it's a very small building that combines the technology that we can find there, the intelligence, but also to implant, implant or implement some prefabricated buildings. So and then we have this futuristic image. We ask him for a, a, a crane. We take a barrel a crane for social responsibility. And then we have a favela, this futuristic image in the favela, crane installing so fast architecture. We spent seven years uh, trying to manage this process, and we stall in seven months. So it's very much, we, it's, not a, it's not a matter of to build a, a infrastructure, it's, a, it's just to build relationships. It's, it's, a, it's, the, it's very easy to build infrastructure, but it's very difficult to really connect the people. No? So uh, they, but then we have this high technology to insert this crane there, but the, this hanging scaffolding that the guys re, uh, uh, really try to try to really to use to install the board, no? This very much the same material that you can find there. This is just metal board, polycarbonate, the same material that come from industrial waste. So these favelas, these fa uh, slums, actually are the territory of the, of the, the j demonstrate the journey that the obsolescence of the material, of the physicality of architecture, uh, really uh, produce in those spaces. Now it's so vibrant, the space. People are there. They, is, they are very proud. They connect several groups uh, around uh, with different, uh, from art um, and sports. And we asking also for another uh, budget to repair the houses that are with the local master that joined to make this effort. And now the favela transforming a kind of um, beautiful space. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not made by red bricks. It's completely different. Uh, so it's, if you see the country club in Caracas, it's exactly the same construction system that the favela, but it's just covered with different materials. So what we are looking at is exactly the same system that we find any places. No? So, but now there is a problem. So kids escape from the school. They want to go to the, to the sport complex. Nobody. Who, they like to know who opened the keys, who, op who have the keys to open the, the sport complex, who take care, how much the class, the class could cost. So the real things are there. Is there. The infrastructure is there, but the real things that we never find, who opened the door, who's taking care of this, who running the spaces, is the, re the, the, real, thi the real thing that is behind architecture. You know? So it's a beautiful scope. Now the people from the buildings going down to the favela to play basketball field because the basketball yards in the, in the buildings are completely destroyed. So it's a, a very optimistic uh, future for them, but at the same time, the government infiltrate their hands there. The last time that I wa was there, so I was wearing a, a teacher from uh, the municipality. So but this completely independent infrastructure. It's a community infrastructure. So now the cartel is operating in the, in the uh, building that is beside that, beside this place, no? And now we create another boundaries. We create another frontiers. And we are looking forward to see what happened in the stairs because a lot of people just put out their business and start to, um, uh, to sell stuff. And there's a, such a, a, an interesting microeconomies that happen after the building. So the building is just an excuse to recreate uh, those spaces. So I'm to, uh, to wrap up this in several statements. So, the time is a relevant resource. So it's, it's better to just keep going with a long-term projects than try to solve project, projects immediately. Because it's the time would really make us understand the cycles of the natural conditions, but also the relations between the community. It's not a matter, just a matter of infrastructure. It's very difficult to build relations. It's easy to build. It's not our technicality what is behind these complexities. So architectures also can see with a logistic chain of actions. If we stop the process there, the social effervescence that we found there to build a building perhaps disappear. So we have to just install things that allow the people to use as a support for several uh, steps. So the time is architecture is actually the time of human relations. It's just the relationship between the people, the ones that really cr uh, create different atmospheres or a way to live. So every building is a space for consultations. It's not just for one consultation. It's, it's con constantly we have to run in a kind of assembling uh, or, or a social structure that allows to distribute the power. But it's also a, a, a public platform. It's a space to share and to return to the street this condition of sharing knowledge and sharing tools, but also to build legacy and to build time. So, what we're looking for now in all these three days is actually 
to really understand what we can do with our knowledge, how we can recreate our practice, to really underst understand why we produce knowledge. Uh, because I, m maybe after seeing that, I have this impression that it's not, um, that we, what we have to do is to really understand the notion of work in our society, you know, to really to produce different vectors of subjectivity and recreate the ways of the everyday life. Thank you very much, Raul, Alejandro, and thank you for this invitation. Thank you, thank you, uh, Alejandro Hayek. Uh, um, last but not least, we'll have uh, Janice Perlman, uh, a senior scholar at the Institute for Latin American Studies at Columbia University and president of the Mega Cities Project. Well, thank you very much. I just loved these presentations today so much. I. Um, I would just like to see a whole other conference where everyone brings community leaders who are doing incredible things around the world and we can translate for them if it's a different language but they get to be the speakers because this is just so, uh, so inspirational. And um, to pick up for what you just said, yes. I think the main thing everyone's been talking about is um, seeing people who live in these communities not as throwaway garbage not as just cheap labor, not as just good consumers of overpriced domestic electric products or voting blocks for candidates, but as the producers of intellectual capital and the creators of cultural um, knowledge and capital that can enrich the entire city. And that's what I think people coming back to all in all. So my talk is going to be about not a physical innovation, but a cultural innovation that exists all the time in all these communities, and I'm calling it Signs of Hope and Defiance Under the Radar. Why under the radar? Well, I've been doing this research for the past three years on the effects of the mega events on the favelas of Rio and the favela residents, and I've been doing research for 50 years on the favelas, and all of a sudden I started seeing something I never saw before. Not just the total uh, denial of human rights and urban rights and housing rights and uh, the right to be alive um, and the dismissal of people in favelas as people without respect or dignity or value, but a flourishing of initiatives by youth, not noticed, not written about in the media, totally under the radar, that was so... Um, inspirational to me and that had not been there as recently as eight years ago. So um, it's kind of like a thousand flowers blooming right under the surface of where people can see because people's perceptions are so conditioned by the ideas they have of what a favela is like. So to give you a, a quote from one of these youth in one of the programs, it's hard to gain recognition in this area. People look at us and think we don't have culture to share, that we don't have knowledge to transmit. If we can manage to survive in the favelas where we live, that alone gives us a lot to explain. And the other one is saying, the voices of the favela continue to be excluded. Others speak about us, even for us, but almost never listen to what we have to say. And we have a lot to say. We believe that in order to create alternatives, we have to discuss the impacts of what's happening, war on drugs and those things, on our lives. We have to think of the solutions that include us and give us opportunities to overcome decades of failed policies. So, um, amidst all of this depressing thing that I was starting to document and feeling really horrible, it was like the um, thousand-petaled white lotus flower emerging from the muck of the waters, the really dark muck that's so thick that it's settled on the bottom of the pond, where these incredibly um, brilliant youth initiatives um, of many, many types. So they were all about, the way I tried to categorize them when I was just thinking about this um, late last night or this morning is, these are way that young people are saying we want a new way to see our history, our identity, who's with us, who are our allies, how far we reach across the territory of the space, what about our voice, 
what about our plans and what about a project for our lives, each of our lives? What would be a life project? So I started dropping all the other things because I think a lot of other people were documenting the negative effects of the Olympics on people in favelas and public policies and I had already done that for a year and a half and looked at these solidarity networks that were being built um, between favelas and non-favelas and other marginalized, undisturbed neighborhoods, regular legitimate neighborhoods in the peripheries that were also suffering from being marginalized and other alliances across generations between youth and the elders, the elders in their own communities because they started thinking, you know, I don't even know how this community started. I mean, so they started going around. The first thing I noticed, they're going around with their iPads and cell phones and interviewing the older people and getting the life history of their communities and digitalizing the photographs that the grandparents and great-grandparents had in their houses and starting to create favela museums and saying, yeah, this is our history. Let's stop being ashamed of coming from a favela and trying to hide it and pretend we're not from a favela. Let's say this is our roots and we, we are here because our parents and grandparents fought the good fight. And so there's an intergenerational alliance in the favela, but also with people outside the favela, Be with academics and activists from few earlier generations, my generation and the generation of my children, if I had children, um, became allies because they could open doors. They wanted to learn from what was happening in the practice every day in the favelas, but the, the young people in the favelas wanted to learn from them. So all these new alliances um, uncovered the community histories, access new identities, expand their base, and, um, well, I was just blown away. And um, so I documented a bunch of these, and I wish I could show you videos of each of them and little clips. Um, many of them have to do with uh, things that are very visual. But let me say, because Harold Lance asked me, why do I think now? Why now? I mean, always young people have been doing things. but. Um, at the end of my last research, which was the research where I went back 30 years later and interviewed the people that I had interviewed in the 60s and their kids and their grandkids, those grandkids were doing pretty well in terms of jobs insertion in the economic uh, world of the city and also insertion in the housing market. But, um, and they knew a lot about what was going on in the world. They were very, very super hyper-connected. But they were really cynical, and they were really angry, and they were really apathetic politically, and they didn't want to do a thing. And all of a sudden, that same generation is starting to find ways that aren't going out in the street and doing protests, um, aren't direct confrontations with political power, but doing things that are confrontational. So I think now, these are my guesses, probably some of you can answer some of these, add to this. I think because the mega events led to so much hype and so much hope and so much um, lived vision of how Rio could be at the center of the world stage and show an example, like in the TED talk of Mayor Eduardo Pais, of the inclusive and sustainable city for all, a city for all that other cities could model after. And then the reality of that vision being totally put aside in terms of pursuing a city that would be a global world city, very good for um, tourists, for the rich uh, residents, and for international investment. I think that created a certain visceral reaction and coupled with, at that same time, the exposure of the degree of corruption in the Lava Jato, in the um, car wash operation, everyone knew there was corruption and under the table bribes. I mean, that's normal in Brazil. It's never been otherwise. But the extent and the complicity of the government and the business world and the construction companies and the vast sums of money that were being put in offshore banks 
when people were being told, we have to close the schools, we can't pay the teachers, oh, we can't pay the doctors anymore, oh my God, we can't serve you, we have, no, we, we have to raise the prices of the bus fare because really, it's just, we're broke. And it was just so blatant that I think that was another spur. The second one was more and more of these people who live in favelas are going to universities. And they're learning exactly what's going on. And they're combining their lived experience with the literature and with learning and with being there and taking action. So they're coming back to their communities. I mean, at the end of my last research, it was 12% um, of the newer generation had been in universities. I think it must be about 20-something now. So they have a new sense of um, uh, self-esteem from that and new, new skills. And then the fourth one was the solidarity. They were excluded from so many things. The festivals of literature that are in Parachi, the Flippy, the uh, artists' spaces for graffiti, the music festivals, all, all always excluding them. So all of a sudden they thought, well, wait a minute, we can do our own. Um, so, and do it with networks. So here's another little quote. Some look at us and see that we're able to do an awful lot with a little and think we must then deserve very little. They see we make it without very much and say, oh, let's just leave them there. I started to really feel this and I thought, wait a minute, if I individually break through this barrier and show what I can do, but I don't bring my people along with me, I will end up alone. No one will be there to support me when I trip up. People will always want to send me back to the place where I came from. What a poor guy. What a failure. So this gives me goose pimples. Whew. So um, anyway, th these are the categories of things I found. One, for identity and memory, to reclaim and reaffirm. The, aside from recording these community histories of the elders, which of course the elders were thrilled because mostly they were ignored by young people or considered irrelevant or embarrassing. They are building, taking spaces in their communities and building favela museums of various types in different communities, um, some not connected to the others. And one, the one that's mo very recent was the Villa Otodrmu, which created a museum of removal, which documented um, all of the struggles and what's happened afterwards and was picked up by the National Museum. It's going to be in the Art Center. Um, <laughs> the position of, the, of, of, of these museums, as one of the women from Rosinha said, these have their feet facing forward, but our heads looking backwards. These museums can serve uh, to raise our visibility and the idea of self-esteem. And then we interviewed people from the Museo do Orto, um, and then the other person says, well, if we don't give value to our history, then no one else will. We have to work on this. It's important that we see ourselves and our history, and they can recognize themselves in this history. So then, the next, favela tours. I won't go into it very much because it's very little time, but this was done by other people, taking people. I went on one of these in a Jeep. You had to pay. Everything was a big lie. I pretended I didn't speak Portuguese so I could hear how, how many lies they were saying. Now the communities are taking them over. They're doing um, word maps of people's image of favelas before they go around the community, and then afterwards, um, it's very, very impressive. A uh, group I love called Baixada Nunca Se Henji, the uh, Belfort Roshu, one of the poorest um, municipalities in the Baixada Fluminense, started to write songs related to the sustainable development goals, what would sustainability, urban inclusion mean, and make it rap songs, and started and made, got a movie made by Rio Plus Center, which is part of the Rio Plus 20, and that went to the UN, it went to um, Mozambique, uh, was shown in the center of Rio, and now they can't even get to, um, they can barely make a living because in Rio still it's so hard to have traction for something that's about Rio and about the poor doing their thing, and they are fighting that. And then there's Favalachi and Baba. The third one, these new alliances across generations. I think I will end with this because I have only one minute. The thing that blew my socks off was a combination of three things, real desencontres, 
Universidade das Quebradas, and Casa Fluminense. These are three alliances with youth and um, very well-known cultural figures, academics, and activists where youth take the lead. They say what they want to learn. They, they create their, um, they made a link with the Federal University to get a certificate course that they could have a certificate from the university through um, some of the very well-known professors in cultural studies. They go to the university once a week. They get their way paid and their lunch paid. This is the University of Quebradas. It's like the University of the Hood or the university at the end of the world. And um, it used to be that a group of middle class people chose the themes and chose the people to come, but now it's all run by the alumni of this program. They pick the themes. Their theme last year was identity. They were reading Lauer Horscher. They were reading the most incredible things. And they're very sophisticated. Um, and then a part of that is they're taking over planning. So they expanded their alliance from just favelas to peripheries, and then from just their communities to the whole metropolitan region. So they're no longer thinking of the unit of analysis as the city of Rio or the state of Rio, but the metropolitan region. And they are having interactive planning, almost done, interactive planning um, sessions with the most incredible facilitators in small groups and large groups um, to work out from people across the whole space of the metropolitan region what would be their future for the post-Olympics? What would be their priorities? Because now there's a new metropolitan regional authority, doesn't have much teeth, but they had to produce a plan, and these young people took the initiative to put um, concreteness in the plan, and the Casa Fluminense is organizing this. And I'll end with um, probably my, one of my favorites. Um, I used to live, one of the places I lived when I was in Rio in 1968 and 69. I lived in a favela in the south zone, one in the north zone, and I lived in Caxias, Duque de Caxias, in a favela called Vila Operaria, extremely poor, uh, extremely remote. And this place has come, become the center of what's called MOFI, the movement of favelas. MOFI is an international graffiti festival in its 11th year <clears throat> where people come from Europe and the United States to participate and film this graffiti festival in a favela where they stay at the houses of the favela residents. They eat with them and there's all, and there's all, every surface is painted by a graffiti artist and some of the families get to choose their theme or their color or their favorite artist. And it's put this place right on the map and created an ongoing income generation. And um, well, it's just transformed this place and then Blah, 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 blah. In short, <laughs> it is totally, to answer the question that's been on the floor since the first day, are we romanticizing favelas? No. We're just not seeing what they really are. Yes, they're poor. We're not romanticizing poverty. We're not thinking it's great to be poor and not have sewage. We're not, not romanticizing that it's great to be in a floodplain, either by flat or by... by um, <laughs> falling down the hillside. But there is something vibrant and creative. And these people are now, their challenge is now, how can we make our livelihoods from doing what we love and we're good at and support ourselves and generate a living from doing our passion? Thank you very much. I think we're just going to open it up uh, for questions, and then Alejandro and I might add some closing comments if we have the time. So questions for the panelists. There's one there. First of all, thanks so much. This is a very incredible contribution for me. I really appreciate your power and your truth and reflection. Uh, I would like to ask you, freely, uh, which is indeed the role of designer in this context uh, and this situation, and if uh, we can research through the arts, uh, through design, uh, to have also a role that is different from facilitation. Thank you. 
Other questions? Let's collect a few. Yeah, there's one there, and then Teresa down here. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is John. I'm from I'm a, I'm from Colombia. So I just want to ask a simple question. Uh, what do you think that hope can uh, create a productivity in the slums and to organize them to build a vibrant and creative life? Thank you. Down here. Just want to thank you all. It's fantastic. Um, I uh, just wanted two comments to what Janice added on to what Janice said. First of all, I, I think hope is, uh, is the, the crucial factor. Um, in 2010, in our social media trainings, I think I mentioned this briefly, we had uh, um, 180 co community organizers from all over Rio. We strategically selected from all over the region. Um, the one thing they all had in common was they wanted a UPP. <laughs> Basically, they wanted the pacification police. There was a sense of hope. That was when the, the crime rate in Rio was at its, you know, I don't know about all-time low, but, but temper, you know, low for the last few decades. Um, and you could feel that energy in communities. A lot of these sorts of projects that Janice was describing was starting out of this sense of optimism, the tourism, the mafia, the graffiti, um, the sense of, of how the city would change. Um, the crime rate, you know, has gone now skyrocketing, and nobody talks about hope um, and hopelessness and the desperation that's been produced from feeling this chronic neglect now after $25 billion were spent in one city um, and very little, if any, of that supported these communities. And then the other thing is the one ingredient that I, I would add to Janice's list is social media. So this, everything she described yeah. also happened in a period where social media became a thing and uh, Brazil really took it on, especially in favelas. We actually have a higher use rate in favelas than outside of favelas in Rio. Um, so I think that was also critical. Yeah, that, that was also that. in my numbers of my things why, but I just skipped yeah. it because. Yeah. Well, thanks, no, you added on the screen. I think she answered your question too, so we can have one more question there. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, no, go, 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 go. I don't know if it's a question or a commentary. I can't finish when, with an interrogation. After you finish, yes. But, but, <laughs> uh, it will be formal. But in, uh, this, because I am I, I'm asking to myself if there is not, don't you feel with me some uh, sense of danger in, 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 in the way we are um, celebrating the. Uh, the actions, independent actions of people in these uh, communities, in some cases, what, from what I heard, against the idea of politics. And I think we live in a, in, a, in a very problematic moment, not just in the third world, even here, I think, in the United States, with this conflict between uh, what I would call populism and democracy. So. We, if we continue to say no to the government, no to the initiative, no to the politicians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I think I think we are in danger in this sense. So um, I, I, this is why I'm saying it's a commentary. But I, I would like to to uh, introduce, uh, if possible, a reflection on this on, on this point. How how could, could we maintain the relation between the popular initiatives, and, which are so important, but at the same time the established institutional governments in democracy. Thank you. Yeah. In, in, in fact, Alejandro Achaveri, so many Alejandros on this one. Uh, yeah, maybe that's something you might want to kind of respond to, too. Yeah, sorry, let's, yeah, well, let's take a question here. No, here, sorry, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is to this panel and to the, the previous one, especially Michael and Livia, and uh, all of you. Um, uh, and it's connected to what uh, Pancho just said. Uh, who participates? And this is a political question, because you've all, uh, you've all shown very uh, uh, f uh, wonderful projects like yours and uh, what well, all the projects you're working on and you know your your the community is participating but we know that not if so who is this who are the people co uh, participating and uh, in the case you presented Livia um, Pancho asked for the people the fact that the 
people inside the community would not see their asset value grow. But then there, are, there is the other people who, who keep out of the community, and uh, which is another question related to who participates and who. Can, can you pass the mic to her? Olivia? Maybe you can start by responding, so we can get, and then come back to the panel. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll wait. We'll take that question. This, is, this is, might have a lot of responses. Sure. Yeah. So in our case, uh, there is a quite a complex uh, set of strategies to encourage participation across the community, uh, across the whole spectrum of the community. We have an advantage that we're working with adjacent communities in a very continuous manner for many years. Uh, so there are activities for children at schools. Uh, currently, there is a new school, elementary school, that was taken over by the community leaders, and its program is particularly on leadership skills and critical thinking and so forth. Uh, so, so the youth get engaged, there's a youth leadership program as well, and then in all the different uh, ways to grab people's attention through sports, through music, through the arts, uh, through public art, uh, through uh, uh, adult literacy programs and many other programs that the community has, all of that in the end is a means to uh, engage them in participation in the decision-making process and make them active in the organizational and political process within the community. So there is a, an intent uh, to make different types of, of ways in uh, that cater to different uh, people in the community depending to their age, their literacy level, etc., cetera, or, or et ethnicity as well, uh, for example. And in, in terms of... Uh, who benefits sorry, wait, wait, wait. sorry to interrupt for a moment. How, how should we do it? Because I think if we need either to have very quick answers, or I was even yeah. tempted to say, have uh, this discussion as part of the fishbowl, fish given that yeah, yeah. So we I have think a that lot. was enough of a response for now. But Alejandro Achaveri, could you respond also to Pancho yes, and some of these questions? No, are we going to wait? We have these responses. I'll come back to you. Sorry, just right here. Um, if we are against the politicians, <laughs> <laughs> I cannot say that. I've been working with uh, exceptional politicians for many years. And uh, so I, every situation is different. I cannot say that the Medellin situation, with, we have an exceptional um, institutional capacity, if you compare even with the Colombian cities. And we have exceptional politicians. Not all of them great, but at least one or two. <laughs> from the last, uh, the last uh, 15 years. But, so I think the city improved a lot. I, it's, it's, it's a fact. But when you go to the history of, of the kids, it still be an incredible challenge. Everyday life, fighting with illegality, trying to connect with local initiatives and trying to open doors and so on. I am not joking saying that I, we, we had the month ago a very beautiful uh, talks and dialogues and, and for me it was like the same, the same conversation that we had 20 years ago. So it's not possible. Something is happening there. So, but of course they have, they have th those kids have more porosity, they have programs that link different places of the city. So the city today is more transparent. transparent. The visibility is, is completely different. This is the, 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 the success. For everybody, the whole city appear, the institutions and so on, but the problems are there. So it's not one solution. So it has to happen in different, in different things. But the power that the local city has is incredible if you could help and develop in more strategic way and connected thi connecting things. And the challenge is how to have a permanent dialogue because the problem is, is the, the discontinuity. You, you know, to build a confidence takes six years, 10 years, five years. In one year to destroy that. Mm -hmm. So it's not possible. It's not possible, but every government brings different agendas. Even with the, the idea of continuity, came new people. They spent two years or three years learn something. And the last year, they realized that those processes are important, and they cut it. 
<laughs> so there is, our question is now is how to develop uh, this conversation that could guide, connect with the local and high level a more permanent dialogue. It's not ideal. We work with imperfection. And the modesty is very important. So this is a question I think we should bring back in the fishbowl because we can go on and on on this. But I just want Alejandro to maybe respond to Ari, Ariana's question about architecture because your project seems to confront that question. Well, so, um, something that we uh, reflect about uh, the role of designers, architects, is, uh, I think there's uh, several ways to relate with that. No? Very much universities are or school of architectures trying to um, create sort of kind of a corbusiers. Uh, now everybody, I mean, there's a different ways to understand our disciplines. Some of us are more related to design, some others to management process. So I think that diversity is what we re really looking for to to really expand the borders between our dis disciplines and to try to find spaces in between with other field of knowledge and. Um, and to, especially to work between them, in boundaries between disciplines. No? The other thing is like, a, um, especially in community projects, uh, the discussions is that if the architects design something that is sophisticated, this is not social. So social is always related with precarity. And I think in social practice is where everything is possible. It's actually where innovation, that I don't like this word, of course, but is, is able to rise. No? And in that sense, um, there is a lot of methodologies that come from 60s, 70s that you go to the community, to, you try to put a board to everybody to participate, to allow the people to draw or the kids to make models, which is beautiful, but it's not the only way to participate. So it, it seems like we refuse to the power of our disciplines in order to be social or to be more close to the community. In fact, what's happened is architects always talk about the community that is about something that is far away from us. Mm -hmm. We never be part of a community. So it's like we talk about the community, we defend the community, but we didn't think that we are part of the community. <laughs> so it's like a crazy stuff. Yes, so, I, so let's take one question. Raul, yeah. I, I would like one, one, okay. one word. Okay, okay, okay. So I, is is not uh, i have to say that the problem are the, is the academy so all the things that you are talking about with the academy is out of that so how to reframe the knowledge and how the school of design and architecture has a different approach more collaborative processes things but this is a structural problem Every, everywhere here too also a question for the fishbowl a pedagogy yes yeah, exactly. Actually, my question was um, if you could share your views on the charge of design pedagogy yes. and of the architect um, and the artifact of architecture and that shift and the agency of our charge. Right. In fact, that's, that's the perfect, because that needs everyone to participate. I won't want to restrict that question to this panel. So if you don't mind, we'll carry it into the fish, because that's what the fishbowl is meant for. So I'm, just one more question, if someone's got something pressing, which is specific to the panel. And if it's more general, then keep it for the fishbowl. Fishbowl, great. Okay, so you know, I just so that we don't eat into the time for the fishbowl, which is that's a critical discussion period of 90 minutes, I think we should break. I just want to make one point that sort of became very vivid for me through this uh, panel, but also from the panel that preceded this, was the notion of infrastructure and its many manifestations and its many forms. I mean, Michael's work is about infrastructure. I mean, I think infrastructure of approach and organization is a form. So I think, and here it gets very specific, I think you, although it was a piece of architecture, it was, it was not monofunctional infrastructure. It did many things. Uh, I think Alejandro Achaveri's work showed us how infrastructure very placed strategically can open up all sorts of connections. And so for me, infrastructure somehow emerges its forms uh, and the creativity that we can bring to imagining infrastructure and its definition, uh, cultural infrastructure, uh, becomes a very important issue that we might be able to carry on with uh, in the fishbowl. So thank you very much. What we have about half an hour, 40 minutes, and we... Oh, wow. 45 minutes. We.